Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to Word Pictures. We're glad you are joining us again. Um, if you are joining us again, if you're a new viewer, we are thrilled to have you with us. We think you're going to enjoy our program. Uh, we are uh, uh, going to take a, a look at the seven last plagues here uh, in our program today. And Ken has asked me to start by reading uh, from Revelation chapter 16, verses 12 through uh, 16. So uh, open your Bible and uh, join me as we read through this. I will be reading from the Good News Bible. Uh, then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great Euphrates River. The river dried up to provide a way for the kings who come from the east. Then I saw three unclean spirits that looked like frogs. They were coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet. They are the spirits of demons that perform miracles. These three spirits go out to all the kings of the world to bring them together for the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Listen, I am coming like a thief. Happy is he who stays awake and guards his clothes so that he will not walk around naked and be ashamed in public. Then the spirits brought the kings together in the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Thank you, Jay. And I suppose that all of you at one time or another, maybe many times, have heard talk about Armageddon. And many people consider Armageddon to be the end of the world, and it is very close to the end of the world, as far as we can tell from the book of Revelation. But in our study of the seven last plagues, we need to back up now a little bit, back to the beginning of Revelation 15. This is where we're the first the Revelation first starts talking about plagues. And let's just look at that for a moment. Then I saw in the sky another mysterious sight. So let's, let's sort of try to move together here. What does mysterious mean in, in Greek? What's the implication of that? Do you remember? Mine says marvelous. Marvelous, okay. Mysterious in Greek talks about something that only the initiated know about. It's, a, it's, it's something that it doesn't, it, it's a mystery to everybody else, but to the people who know, it's not mysterious. Great and amazing it is. There were seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last ones, because they are the final expression of God's anger. And that's one of the things we need to discuss, God's anger here. How does God display his anger? Well, then I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire. Now, what you would expect after what you just read, that we're going to see, what? The seven last plagues. What happens in the seven last plagues, right? But well, notice we have something coming first. Then I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire. I also saw those who had won the victory over the beast and its image and over the one whose na name is represented by a number. And you remember that, what, what did, where was it talking about all of that? The beast and his number. Where do we first read about that? Well, it's in Daniel, but in Revelation, it's especially in chapter 13, the last few verses of chapter 13. And then God responds in chapter 14 and says what? You remember? He says, the people who receive the mark and, you know, don't accept it, 
whether on their forehead or on the hand, are going to have some really, really tough times, right? In the third angel's message. And then at the end after that, we actually come down, I, I should have looked at that first, the last few verses of Revelation 14. And it says, Then I looked, and there was a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was what looked like a human being, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out from the temple, temple and what would that, where would that be? Heaven. This sounds like the temple in heaven, doesn't it? And cried out in a loud voice to the one who was sitting on the cloud, Use your sickle and reap the harvest, because the time has come, the earth is ripe for the harvest. Then the one who sat on the cloud swung his sickle on the earth, and the earth's harvest was reaped. Then he saw another angel come out of the temple in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. Then another angel who was in charge of the fire came from the altar. He shouted in a loud voice to the angel who had the sharp sickle, Use your sickle and cut the grapes from the vineyard of the earth. Cut the grapes from the vine and, I'm sorry, because the grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle on the earth, cut the grapes from the vine, and threw them into the vine pr wine press of God's furious anger. The grapes were squeezed out of the wine press outside the city, and blood came out of the wine press in a flood 300 kilometers long and nearly two meters deep. Of course, you recognize the um, metric measurements there. Uh, that would be about 200 miles and about six feet deep, up to the horse's bridles, remember, in the, I think it says in the King James. So what does that tell us? Now remember that in the original there were no breaks, there were no chapter breaks, there were no verse breaks, it just went right on here. So immediately if you were reading along, if you were hearing this for the first time, you would say, what are we talking about now? But also, Revelation is not in chronological order. No, not always. It, it goes back and forth, yeah, but what are, we t what, is that, what are those last few verses in Revelation 14 talking about? Well, it sounds like, it's uh, sounds kind of like the, uh, the end of the world. Yeah, Second coming, the, the harvest, the, this, is the, this is the end, right? And then he sees this mysterious sight we read about a moment ago. And here are God's people in verse 2, uh, standing beside the this, this sea of glass, uh, and they're, they're people who've won the victory over the beast in its image and over the one whose name is represented by a number. So these are people who lived at what time in history? Well, this is right, this very is about right at the end. Right, right at the end, because the beast and the image, and all, it doesn't form until the very end, right? They were standing by the sea of glass holding harps that God had given them and singing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Can I have a question? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> We have had here uh, an angel who is one of the things that, that, that we've read here is there's an angel who's come out of the temple mm -hmm. and we've kind of interpreted that to be a kind of a literal, a literal place. Yeah. And there's another angel that comes down with a sickle and he's harvesting these grapes which we, which we, we tend to interpret that as being figurative. Mm -hmm. So how do we know how do we know when to be figured, even when to be real back and forth here? And now we've got uh, uh, some, some angels with harps that are singing here. Um, well, these aren't angels anymore. These are the redeemed, right? Well, all right. But we're going back for my question is here. We've got, we've got literal, we've got figurative, all right. kind of in the same. How, do, how, do, how can we start with a paragraph and go through it? Well, that's figured even. No, that one. No, that one right there. That's literal because it fits my theology. But this other one down here, how do we... How do we well, I mean, that's a very good question. And I think the only right answer to that question is you read it and then you read it again and you read it again until the story sort of gets clear in your mind. And then you say, okay, clearly some of these... I mean, harvesting grapes, does God really harvesting little grapes, that probably doesn't make too much sense, does it? Uh, it you know, that's probably not what God is up to. Well, there, so, are other, there are other passages throughout Scripture that refer to that event and the harvest, and it's, it's obvious not, you know, they're not real grapes. Okay, so that's the kind, if we see something that really seems to suggest it's not literal, then we should do that. If 
there's signs, and we're going to struggle with that question, especially when we get over to chapter 16. There's a lot of stuff that sounds very literal. Are we going to say they're all literal? So, so you raised a very important question, and let's keep it almost in front of our thinking as we move on, okay? Um, what we have entered into now is the second half of the book of Revelation. What do I mean by the second half? We're not talking about you know, counting words and that kind of stuff. What we're really talking about is this. The first half of the book of Revelation has talked about the history of our world, the history of the Christian church, and it's gone back, and as Yoli mentioned, it repeats a certain amount, but basically it's talking about the history of our world from the time of the death of Jesus down to approximately our day. From now on, we're going to talk about things that happen during what is called the time of the end. Not the end of time, but the time of the end. And we as Seventh-day Adventists have understood that that refers to whatever happens after when? 1844. Yeah, when the final uh, time prophecy comes to an end. So, um, Revelation 15 through 22, these are all events directly connected with either the second coming just before it, just after it, or following that up until the third coming, and finally, of course, God's establishing his kingdom here on this earth. And we have suggested already that understanding the book of Revelation, you must read it several times, and you must have in your mind a clear picture of some of the symbolism from the Old Testament. So people who are very familiar with the symbols of the Old Testament have a lot easier time picking out J, the symbolism here, as opposed to people who maybe haven't read it many times. Um, but one of the first questions we have to struggle with here is, what is God's wrath? Is it perfectly you're obvious? Not, you're not going to get it uh, by studying Revelation. No. And uh, you have to be pretty well settled, and, and even and then some perhaps, you know, to, re to keep it consistent. God says, I never change. Mm -hmm. And uh, if God is love. So he has to be consistent, or at least uh, if he's going to be what he claims to be, which I believe mm -hmm. he is, so we have to go back to Hosea and a few places in the Old Testament where God says, you're bent on going, you're exercising your own self-centered uh, way, I'll let you go. And that yeah. appears as God's wrath. Because then Romans is a classic one in Romans yeah. 1. Well, let's look at some of those verses to really places where the Bible seems to describe what, do, what God does when he's, quote, angry. One of the earliest is found in Numbers 12, verses 9 and 10, the first part of verse 10. The Lord was angry with them. This was Miriam and Aaron. They were accusing Moses because he had married this woman that wasn't an Israelite. The Lord was angry with them, and so he departed, and the cloud left the tent. Miriam's skin was suddenly covered with a dreaded disease and turned as white as snow. So when the Lord was angry, what did he do? He left. He left. Hmm, that's interesting. That's not what usually happens when some of us get angry, right? We want to start throwing, you know, swinging our fists and do things like that, right? Well, so, what about the part of the, um, the whitest snow skin? Well, that's describing what was anciently called leprosy. Yeah, and, and, but um, why did that happen if it's just him leaving? Well, because he left her with that problem. He left, he didn't, she didn't have the problem before. No. So it looks like he did leave and well, say, by the way, yeah, okay, you can, you can say that. Remember, the, what, would, what should happen when the Lord leaves is you should be dead. Because he's the only source of life. So coming up with leprosy, which was soon healed, was a, was a much better plan. Um, so, look at, yeah? so we've established that we don't, we don't look at the book of Revelation for the definition of God's anger or wrath, and we don't look in the dictionary. No. Either. We look to the rest of the Bible. Okay. So Deuteronomy 31, verses 16 to 18. The Lord said to Moses, You will soon die, and after your death the people will become unfaithful to me and break the covenant that I made with them. They will abandon me and worship the pagan gods of the land they are about to enter. When that happens, what will happen? What comes next? I will become angry with them. I will abandon them, and they will be destroyed. Many terrible diseases will come upon them, and then 
they will realize that these things are happening to them because I, their God, am no longer with them. That's pretty clear, isn't it? <clears throat> and I will refuse to help them then because they have done evil and worshipped other gods. Now, there are other places like Joshua 7, 1 to 12, Judges 2, 12 to 14, 19 to 23, Judges 3, 7 to 9, Judges 10, 6 to 12. And by the way, if you are interested in those materials or the handouts we use in our program here, you, are, uh, you can get them uh, at our website. It's uh, www.theox, that's T-H-E-O-X, dot O-R-G. Did you happen to mention uh, Jeremiah 7, 16 through 20? I didn't, but there's lots of places, yeah. You where it to... says, you know, that what, they, what they were doing, they were the uh, fathers were gathering sticks and the uh, women were kneading dough and the children mm -hmm. uh, to bake cakes for the uh, Queen of Heaven. For the Queen of Heaven. And he says, they're doing, are they doing it to provoke me to anger? And he says, no, they're doing it to their own confusion. It's mm -hmm. what sin does to the people not what it does to God. Mm -hmm. so. Well, as Jim already mentioned, Romans 1 maybe is the real key. Now, now we're turning to the New Testament. Romans 1, 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of men who by their wickedness suppress the truth. And what does God do? Well, if you follow down the passage there, depending on your translation, in the actual Greek, God's name is not mentioned again until you get to verse 24. Therefore, God gave them up in the loss of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. And then verse 26, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. And you come down to verse 28, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a base mind and to improper conduct. So it says three times there in that, that paragraph and a half or something, that when God's anger is expressed, he does what? He gives them up. The word in, in, in Greek is paradidomi. He hands them over. So how does, this, how does this make God out any better? And instead of, instead of pointing his finger and, and a little bit of lightning and turning them into a, a, an extinguished crisp, mm -hmm. he just walks away and leaves them to so how, how, do, how does that He how leaves does them to reap the consequences of their own behavior, the choices they have made for themselves. Why didn't he just stick around so that that doesn't happen? Well, he's usually giving them plenty of warnings. Yeah, that exactly. Happens. And there's, there's an even... Is he, is he giving them up or are we walking away? Well, we already read one passage that says the people walked away from God, so finally he ended up walking away from them. I so... You know, my, my perception of sin, and I think we've defined it here before, is sin is, is one's self-separation from God. God is a source of life, and by your actions or your attitudes or whatever, you're the one that draws away from this life source. So... Yeah. So, let me look at another example. Was God's wrath poured out on Jesus at the cross? Romans 4.25. This should be the classic example. Romans 4.25, Paul says, because of our sins, he was handed over, and my version says to die. Most versions say to die. But in actual fact, there's nothing in the Greek about dying. It just says because of our sins, he was handed over. And it's exactly the same word that we use for God's wrath in Romans 1. And the question really we need to ask ourselves is, is what did Jesus say was happening when he was about to die? His father had forsaken him. My God, my God, why did you abandon me? So, I mean, that ought to be the classic example of what God does when he's, quote, angry or he's pouring out his wrath. Did Christ suffer under God's wrath? Yes, he did. What does that mean? It means that God left him. Well, as we see God's anger expressed in Scripture, let's, him, let's always remember what he said in Hosea 11, 7-9. They insist on turning away from me. Jay, there's your point. They will cry out because of the yoke that is on them, but no one will lift it from them. But how can I give you up, Israel? How can I abandon you? Could I ever destroy you as I did Adma or treat you as I did Zeboim? Adma and Zeboim were two small towns right close to Sodom that were also de de destroyed with Sodom. My heart will not let me do it. My love for you is too strong. I will not punish you in my anger. 
I will not destroy Israel again. For I am God and not a human being. I'm the, I, the Holy One, am with you. I will not come to you in anger. I mean, you know, that's pretty plain, isn't it? How he feels about doing all this. So we see that God's wrath or his anger is simply his turning away and loving disappointment from those who do not want him anyway, thus leaving them to the inevitable and awful consequences of their own rebellious choices. Could this be the meaning of God's wrath in Revelation? Well, is it possible that those who have chosen to worship the beast in his image, thus following the devil himself, have reached the place where God can do nothing more for them? And God must finally let them go to reap the consequences of their own choices? What happens when, when, when God conducts this massive campaign in Revelation 13 and virtually the whole world follows him? What is God supposed to do? The devil. When the devil conducts a campaign. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's what, did I say God? Yeah. Sorry. When the devil conducts this massive campaign and the whole world follows him. Um, so now we have that question. What is God's wrath? There are several expressions in these two chapters that raise serious questions about the understanding that God is the one who's pouring out these plagues. We've already looked at a couple of them in Revelation 15, 2 and 4. Would the righteous be standing by the sea of glass rejoicing about how the actions of God are so righteous if he just lost his temper and was zapping people? Or would, you, would they be running for cover? I mean, you know. It's a little incongruous. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, so uh, God, could this be the meaning of God's wrath in Revelation? In other words, is it correct to let the Bible interpret itself? Should we take the, the words of the Bible and let them say, okay, this is what we mean when we use these words, there's a lot of words, and particularly in the book of Revelation, we're going to find words that we need to get the definitions elsewhere in the Bible, because this is a very concentrated presentation, and it depends. You can't read Revelation unless you have a pretty good understanding of the rest of the Bible. Well, when the fourth angel pours out his bowl in the sun and people are burned with fiery heat, they curse the name of God who has authority over these plagues. Now, earlier in the chapter, it used the word dunamis, which is God's power. It do, here it doesn't say God is using his power in pouring out these plagues. He's using his authority. What's the difference between power and authority? Well, uh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Authority is uh, a certain right. Yes. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's something you... It's a... It's a it's a, it's an entitlement. It's a control over uh, over a certain over certain situations, and you have the right to uh, to to exercise your will in this matter. Okay. You work in a large teaching institution. <coughs> um, who exercises most of the authority? Sometimes I think my students do. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's not the way it's supposed to work. <laughs> it's supposed to be the, the, the dean or, or the president or somebody up there that's in charge. But often that person doesn't, I mean, even if it comes to discipline, often that person doesn't do it himself. He exercises authority, says you have to go and do thus and so in disciplining your student or something like that. So in this case, we have God saying, okay, I'm allowing the Satan to do his thing. Okay. Is that possible? Uh, sometimes authority, though, is, um, well, it can be empty, but like when you call it an authority to court to talk about something, it's something that that person knows about, that he understands it completely. So it's not necessarily that person is, is ordering somebody around, mm -hmm. it's that he knows. Yeah. So, well, that's a, that's a different me use of the meaning of the word authority. You're talking about a person now. Well, when I read this, I read that into it. Okay. But to you, you seem to be reading, I, I, do this, go over here, go over there, go over yeah. there. Mm -hmm. You know, which, okay, that, that could well, be. Well, when it says God exercises his authority, it doesn't sound like he's talking about a person. Well, God exercises authority because he knows. Well, 
okay. exercise has different meanings too, the same yeah. as authority does. You have to mm -hmm. look it up as most appropriate way you can. <clears throat> in, in the case of the example you, men you mentioned a moment ago about a dean exercising authority, um, in that kind of a case, uh, and many similar cases, the authority is is something granted to the dean. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's another another uh, entity yeah. that is that is 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 the authority. Yeah. Are, are we could we say here that? Uh, and and this is stretching it a little bit. And I'm not sure it's even accurate. But the thought did cross my mind: is is God acting in a way on the authority of? Uh, the laws that he has established in the universe. That these, they, these things are set up, and, and uh, if, if it's going to be done right, he must comply. We're saying that God is complying with things, that's, but you know, he has to work by the rules too, yeah. or at least he chooses to work by yeah. the rules. Well, it's important to recognize here something that many of our Christian friends don't recognize, and that's that reality, according to the book of Revelation, according to the New Testament particularly, is a three-cornered thing and not just a two-cornered thing. What do I mean by that? We mean that there, God is on one side, one corner, human beings on another corner, but there's also a vast group of angels and beings that live in other, other worlds that are out there, and God has to make sure that what he does is, you know, is clear and plain to the rest of these people. It's kind of like a Congress. The president can act, but the Congress is sitting over there judging his actions all the time, and the people get the result. So uh, God in, is, is dealing with that problem as well. And the devil is at the same time trying to also win the, you know, the allegiance of these other people. Now he's long since lost it because he, of what he did, particularly in connection to the life of Christ. We need to remember though that this law is not something that God arbitrarily established. Yeah. It, God, in his foreknowledge, knows how things function, how relationships are interpersonal or interbeing or uh, universal uh, things function. And he, he has described how those things function, but uh, to a finite being who doesn't have the, the, all the knowledge of the infinite one, uh, it takes a lot of time for them to learn how, that, how those things function, and uh, so that's what we have. And he has to let uh, demonstrate uh, the results of, of individuals going their own self-centered way. And all the ultimate demonstration was Jesus at the cross demonstrated what happens to a sinner mm -hmm. when God lets you go, mm -hmm. stops keeping you alive. In, in a sense, God has, God has limited <coughs> himself. Mm -hmm. He has created me, and it's my perception, all the created all the beings, and he said, you can choose. Right. You have a will, and you can exercise that will, and you can, you can choose. You don't have to do. Uh, right. That's because God is love. Mm -hmm. Love means you have to make have ch a choice available to you. You have and to have freedom. Yes, and, and it's not to make a choice uh, with a gun to your head or uh, yeah. any other metaphor you use. It's either choose to live in harmony or you choose to go your own self-centered way. Mm -hmm. Well, we're trying to sort of struggle with the question of who sends out these plagues. And that's a huge question. It's a tough question. It's a question that probably is the most important question we need to ask ourselves when we're looking at these plagues. And we're going to take another look at the verses that Jay read to us a little bit earlier when we come back from our break. Turn your Bibles to Revelation 16. We'll be right back.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. That sixth plague has some puzzling parts to it. Then I saw three unclean spirits that look like frogs. Now, does unclean spirits that look like frogs, does that sound like something that God would send? Not superficially, right? They were coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet. Okay, now dragon, beast, and false prophet, where did we run across those individuals before? Dragon, who's that referring to? Satan. Back in Revelation 12, it's Satan. So clearly, this plague has something to do with Satan, right? They are the spirits of demons that perform miracles. Does the devil have the ability to perform miracles? Yes, yes he does. Supernatural miracles. These three spirits go out to all the kings of the world to bring them together for the battle of the great day of Almighty God. Now, back in Revelation 13, we saw that everybody's virtually, almost the whole world is following Satan. So now he's trying to bring them together to attack God, it looks like. Listen, I'm coming like a thief. And suddenly God responds. Happy is he who stays awake and guards his clothes so that he will not walk around naked and be ashamed in public. Now, who do you suppose is talking there? It's not talking about the devil is not warning us. He doesn't want us to, to hurry up and get ready. It could only be Jesus, right? Surely none of us would suggest that those demons are out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet are God's actions. Why do you think, um, you see any significance to frogs? Is there anything in the Bible that would that would shed some light on why they call them frogs? Why couldn't they be fish or salamanders? Yeah. Maybe or, Exodus? Huh? Well, the only other place I know of what talks about frogs significantly is, is in one of the plagues in Egypt. Yeah. Is, there, is there a hint in that these are, uh, these are beasts in, in a way? Mm -hmm. You know, in prophetic interpretation, mm -hmm. beasts are used often to represent uh, kings and nations and powers and things like that. <clears throat> is there a significance that these are these are creatures? Creatures, yeah. <clears throat> rather than some kind of just a an idea. And the fact that they came out of the mouth, mm -hmm. it sounds like there was some speaking going yeah. on that exactly that um, did something that created these demons that um, did these miracles. So. I don't know what, it was, what the significance is that they look like as frogs because they clearly identified them in the next sentence as demons. Mm -hmm. Well, now let's look at each of the plagues individually. Are these plagues describing something symbolically, Jay? Or are they talking about the reality of future events? When the first, first angel pours out his bowl, there are terrible and painful sores. These seem to be quite literal rather than symbolic. I mean, if you hear of plagues being poured out on this earth and people are suffering terrible sores, does that immediately strike you as something symbolic or does it sound more like something literal? I think it's literal. Well, the, your immediate interpretation would be literal because that's a disposition, but that would be my question. Maybe I, if I'm interpreting these to be literal sores, Maybe I should be interpreting something else. Maybe it's a, a figurative well, thing. Maybe it's a sore of the mind. Or okay, what would be a disease symbolic? Disease of the mind. What would be a symbolic sore? <clears throat> I don't know. Leprosy of the mind, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that disturbed thought. <laughs> quite sure how that works exactly. But, but you know, everything in here could be symbolic. Some things could be real. I don't mm -hmm. know. But it seems like you can start out by thinking, okay, everything's symbolic, and try to, to figure what things could be actually literal. Anything that's symbolic still is real. Mm -hmm. It's real. It's pointing to something real. It's not just something in your mind. And uh, so somehow... <coughs> Words, like symbols, have a pointing function. So if you're going to make it a symbol, you're, you have to say, okay, it clearly points to something else. So you've you got to say, 
just I think it's a symbol and that's it. You have to say a symbol pointing to yeah, there's something, something else. there that's real that that they're using. It's mm -hmm. not it's not just a figment of a mind that's that's going around doing all this, you know, nothing. But but it is pointing to something. What about the second angel? He pours out his bowl on the sea, and the water becomes like the blood of a dead person. Does that sound real? Well, it was real, real at one time. Yeah. In the time of Moses, it was. Yeah. Well, it could mean death. It could mean, you know, the aftermath of a of a big well, disease or something like that. Um, there's all kinds of things yeah. that it could point to. Recently, science has told us that about half of our air, oh, oxygen, I ought to be more specific, about half of the oxygen we breathe comes from plankton that live in the sea. They actually absorb sunlight and absorb carbon dioxide and give off oxygen, which come, escapes the surface of the water and floats around in the air until it gets to us. And we, of course, uh, come, turn the oxygen back into carbon dioxide and it goes around and around. Well, if all of a sudden the sea is, I mean, some people have said, well, it's probably not real blood. Uh, there are, there's a red organism that sometimes is called a red tide in the ocean, and, and it turns the water looking like blood. But what happens to the normal plankton under those circumstances? They don't perform well, do they? So if, if everything in the sea dies, we're all dead. You know, that's, a, that's not just a, well, sorry about that, let's move on. Uh, and then, of course, the next plague is what? The springs of water and the lakes and the rivers turn to blood. And it goes on, the third, fourth, and fifth plagues, I mean, we can look at them, but they all sound very literal. Yeah. I mean... It's all well, designed to create <clears throat> major discomfort. Mm -hmm. Whether it's literal or figurative, the consequences are going to be the same. Well, we have, we have a pretty clear picture of what the consequences are going to be, don't we? And then there's that sixth plague we come back to again, and that's the one that's described in much more detail than any of the others. But just before we come to the last part of the sixth plague, are we sure that the verse 16 there, listen, I'm coming like a thief, happy is he who stays awake and guards his clothes so that he will not walk around naked and be ashamed of public? Are we sure that's Jesus talking? Why wouldn't it be? Why would it be or why wouldn't, why wouldn't it? it be? Well, it's in the middle of a plague. Why would that be in the middle of a plague? Well, it looks like there's a test going on. Oh, okay. Well, there are, He's giving some hope. Yeah. There, there are other passages uh, earlier in the New Testament that refer to Jesus when he comes. He would be coming like a thief in the night. First Second Thessalonians coming. 5. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is repetition of things we should have already studied. Okay, then the spirits brought the kings together and placed that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Well, we have to get to that in a few moments. Those who wish to study in more depth, there are some very interesting parallels between the seven trumpets earlier in Revelation and these seven plagues. There are also interesting parallels between the seven last plagues and the ten plagues that fell in Egypt. Notice that in both cases, for example, there were rivers, blood, frogs, boils, hailstones, an ominous darkness, and a lot of people dying in both cases. And when the ten plagues of, on Egypt were finished, what happened? God's people escaped from Egypt, right? So in the case of the seven last plagues, we are told that the sixth plague will involve the great battle of Armageddon. What does Armageddon stand for? Notice that it says in the Hebrew Armageddon. So we would immediately get the impression that the Armageddon word comes from where? It's a Hebrew word, right? That has been sort of brought into, into Greek. So how do you bring Hebrew words into Greek? Well, we go back and we start looking, and when we look at the Hebrew, we realize that this expression, taken superficially, suggests har, which is the, is the Greek word, I'm sorry, is the Hebrew word for mountain, and Megiddo. Well, that at least that's a possibility. Har Megiddo, the mountain of Megiddo. But where's the mountain of Megiddo? It's just a tell, a small... There's a little, there's a little bit a of a hill. I was there a few weeks ago. Yeah. It's no mountain, and there's no mountain anywhere around. 
Megiddo is a, val is a plain, it's a valley, it's a big valley where there's a river comes through that, that actually drains out to the, to the Mediterranean. So there's no mountain of Megiddo, so that's not helpful. And there's no such place mentioned in the Bible by, specifically by that, certainly nothing in the Old Testament. Um, so we start looking at other things in, in the Old Testament, and we, we look at, interestingly enough, at Isaiah 14, 13. And if you remember, this is a passage that talks about Lucifer, the bright morning star, sometimes referred to as the king of Babylonia, in Isaiah 14, 12, and then we get to 13, you were determined to climb up to heaven and place your throne above the highest stars. You thought you would sit like a king on that mountain in the north where the gods assemble. There's a mountain in the north. That they believe that the, that the gods lived way far in the north somewhere where the gods assemble. The word for assembly in Hebrew is moed or it can be it could be Megiddo, something close to Megiddo. Magadon or Magadon. Uh, so you thought you were sitting like so the closest Hebrew that we can find to match Armageddon is this passage, which uses the word Har Moed, the Mount of Assembly. And suddenly remember that Satan has always wanted to be in the place of God. That was his goal from the very beginning, and now he wants to take his place on the Mount of Assembly, the very place of God. So now what would that tell us about the battle of Armageddon or Armageddon? It sounds like it's been going on already. If you really okay, think well, about it. But then who are the two sides in this battle? Well, it says in Revelation Is this is, is this US versus Russia? Nope. In Revelation 12, we talk about Michael and the dragon. Yeah. So that that started even before this, so so um I don't know if you call the final battle of Mag mm -hmm. Armageddon is is actually, mm -hmm. you know, the final battle. Like there have been battles before. But this battle goes on in the mind, mm -hmm. this is more not figurative. throwing rocks or having tanks or well, the cruise battle, missiles. Well, the battle has been that way ever since it right. started. Right. So. Well, there's a very interesting difference between how you need to read the Old Testament, how you need to read the New Testament, that maybe we need to mention here. <clears throat> In the Old Testament, the children of Israel were surrounded by people who were polytheists. What's a polytheist? Many, many many gods. Gods. People who worship many different gods. You, you would try to appease the good gods so they would bless you, and you try not to offend the bad gods so they won't curse you, and so forth. But the children of Israel were told what in Exodus 20 verse 3? first of the Ten Commandments, have, have no other gods before me or beside me, okay? So God has told them there, there are how many gods? One. And I'm it, right? Well, well if, there's, some, there's talk in the Bible about gods as in the small g, though. Yeah, well, that's what we're but talking they're about. Not, the, they're not um, put first, that's for sure. No, but we're talking about pagan gods. Are talking about pagan gods? Yes. Mm, could be. There's a place, I will say, you in the book of, of Psalms, there's a place where it talks about human beings being like gods. And that's a small g. If that's what you're thinking about, I don't know. Uh, well, but what we notice here is that God, in effect, if you read through the Old Testament, you get the impression that everything in the Old Testament is caused by Yahweh the God of the Old Testament. Let me give you an example. Look at 1 Chronicles chapter 10, verses 3 and 4. 1 Chronicles chapter 10, that's way back in the Old Testament. I'm looking, reading from my Good News Bible. The fighting was heavy around Saul. He was the first king of Israel, you remember. And he was hit by enemy arrows and badly wounded. He said to the young man carrying his weapons, draw your sword and kill me to keep these godless Philistines from gloating over me. But the young man was too terrified to do it, so Saul took his own sword and threw himself on it. Now, if I said, if someone went to court today and we explained someone's death, and he has all the pictures to prove it, that this is how they died, what would we call that? Suicide. A suicide. It was a more, probably a mortal wound, but ultimately died as a suicide, right? 
What's very interesting to go down to verses 13 and 14, in that exact same chapter, 10 verses later, it says, Saul died because he stuck a sword in himself. No, Saul died because he was unfaithful to the Lord. His disobedient, he disobeyed the Lord's commands. He tried to find guidance by consulting the spirits of the dead instead of consulting the Lord. So the Lord killed him and gave control of the kingdom to David, son of Jesse. Who killed him? God killed him. Monotheism. This is monotheism. Whatever happens, good or bad, there's only one God up there that you can blame for everything that happens. God must be responsible, right? But in the New Testament, what do we see? Especially here in the book of Revelation, there is two sides to this conflict. There's God's side and there's an opposing side that's trying to take over God's place and trying in every way possible to misrepresent God, to slander Him. Um, so clearly Saul committed suicide, and yet a few verses later he says God killed him. Could something similar be happening in John's thinking in Revelation? Consider these comments from Ellen White, one of the founders of the Adventist Church. And this is found in one of her books called Great Controversy. And I'm going to read a couple of other passages from her as well. Satan works through the elements also to garner his harvest of unprepared souls. Now we read at the end of chapter 14 who's sending, who's sending the sickle and doing the harvesting? Looks like it's God, right? Now Satan's also got a harvest going. He has studied the secrets of the laboratories of nature and he uses all his power to control the elements as far as God allows. When he was suffered to afflict Job, how quickly flocks and herds, servants, houses, children were swept away, one trouble succeeding another as in a moment. It is God that shields his creatures and hedges them in from the power of the destroyer. In other words, we're sitting here alive today because God is shielding us. God is keeping us alive. The devil would destroy us instantly if he could. Um, but the Christian world have shown contempt for the law of Jehovah, and the Lord will do just what he has declared that he would. He will withdraw his blessings. He's doing what? Withdrawing his blessings from the earth and removing his protective care from those who are rebelling against his law and teaching and forcing others to do the same. Satan has control of all whom God does not especially guard. He will favor and prosper some in order to further his own designs, and he will bring trouble upon others and lead men to believe that it is God who is afflicting them. So, he's going to bring the trouble, and who is he going to blame? God. Great Controversy 589, paragraph 2. Elsewhere, Ellen White says, I was shown that the judgments of God would not come directly out from the Lord upon them, but in this way. Now, is she talking specifically about the seven last plagues? Sounds like it. They place themselves beyond his protection. He warns, corrects, reproves, and points out the only path of safety. Then if those who have been the objects of his special care will follow their own course, independent of the Spirit of God, after repeated warnings, if they choose their own way, that he does not commission his angels to prevent Satan's decided attacks upon them. It is Satan's power that is at work at sea and on the land, bringing calamity and distress and sweeping off multitudes to make sure of his prey. That's uh, found in Last Day Events, 242, paragraph 2. It was written in 1883. So, is this exactly what happened in Egypt with those ten plagues? Or was that a different situation? That was a different story. What, let's just talk about that for a second. If you read Exodus 12, verse 12, maybe we should just go and do that just really quickly. There was a different story going on there. Exodus 12, uh, verse 12. There was uh, certainly plenty of warning yeah. for each plague. Mm -hmm. and, and the first three plagues, they were, they were almost warnings in themselves. Nobody yeah. died. There was no serious, just an inconvenient thing. Yeah. Well, on that night, now this is God speaking, Exodus 12, verse 12, on that night 
I will go through the land of Egypt, killing every firstborn male, both human and animal, and punishing all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. So if you go back and you look at the whole picture, what's happening there in, in, in Egypt? God, every time the, the Egyptians are turning to another one of their gods, the true God turns that God into a plague. He, they turn to another God, and what does God do? He turns it into a plague. They turn to another God, and what does God do? He turns it into a plague. What, what is, this is a contest between gods. And this, these, these plagues of flies and frogs and so forth, these were all uh, uh, creatures that uh, the Egyptians came to worship. Yes. And if you go to Egypt today, even though they're Islamic and so forth, and there's, there's of course, uh, some Christians and others there, but mostly Islamic people, you can go there on the streets and, and buy little imitations of these ancient gods, flies and frogs and you can buy them. That's what they worshipped. Okay? So, so the plagues in Egypt were to punish the gods. What yes. are the, uh, the gods of the Egypt? Well, that's what, what we're... the plagues? Yes. Or to show the Egyptians that their gods weren't gods. Yes. Is that what the last plagues are? Well, for? let's read a few more verses and we'll see. Okay? Already the Spirit of God insulted... I'm sorry. Let's back up. God will use his enemies as instruments to punish those who have followed their own pernicious ways whereby the truth of God has been misrepresented, misjudged, and dishonored. Now, last day events, page 242 again. Already the Spirit of God insulted, refused, abused, as being withdrawn from the earth. Just as fast as God's Spirit is taken away, Satan's cruel work will be done upon land and sea. Who's doing it? The wicked are past the boundary of their probation. The Spirit of God persistently resisted has been at last withdrawn. Unsheltered by divine grace, they have no protection from the wicked one. Satan will then plunge the inhabitants of the earth into one great final trouble. As the angels of God cease to hold and check the fierce winds of human passion, all the elements of strife will be let loose. The whole world will be involved in ruin more terrible than that which came upon Jerusalem of old. A single angel destroyed all the firstborn of the Egyptians and filled the land with mourning. But David offended against God, I'm sorry, when David offended against God by numbering the people, one angel caused that terrible destruction by which his sin was punished. And if you remember, 70,000 people died. The same destructive power exercised by holy angels when God commands will be exercised by evil angels when he permits. There are forces now ready and only waiting the divine permission to spread desolation everywhere. Great Controversy 614, paragraphs 1 and 2. Question. Yes. As with uh, Job, mm -hmm. is God involved in some, some sort of um, like omission, <laughs> by omission allowing awful things to happen? He doesn't use his power because we were speaking before between the difference between power and uh, authority. authority. Mm -hmm. It's almost like he gives authority to the devil to go ahead and do all this stuff. Okay, and what has the devil always wanted to do? To be like God. He wants destroy. 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 And to have to authority. He doesn't want to be like God, really. He God. wants to have the power of God. He wants to act like God. And he has always claimed that if he could be in charge, things would be better. In other words, he believes that the selfish way is better than the loving way. Okay? And God at the end is saying, okay, Satan, I'm going to withdraw myself slowly, 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 and you can have more and more char, you know, more and more authority here on this earth, and we will see what the world would be like if you were in charge. Now, is this still de decision time, or are the decisions all made? Well, the seven last plagues happen after the decisions have been made because this happens after the close of probation. Okay? Which means that nobody would turn... Nobody's going to change their mind change here. Their mind. Mm -hmm. Well, down through history, we have records of church authorities scaring people, threatening them with God's anger, until people have come to think of God as a monster, just waiting to punish people for their sins. 
Is that a correct picture of our loving Heavenly Father? Well, we have this word from Ellen White as well. If we are not to regard God as waiting to punish the sinner for his sin. The sinner brings the punishment upon himself. His own actions start a train of circumstances that bring the sure result. Every act of transgression reacts upon the sinner, works in him a change of character, and makes it more easy for him to transgress again. By choosing to sin, men separate themselves from God, cut themselves off from the channel of blessing, and the sure result is ruin and death. Volume 1 of Selected Messages, page 235. So what have we learned about God in these passages? Well, in light of what have we seen in this study, would we dare to suggest that at least the first six plagues will actually be caused by Satan and not by God? Remember Genesis 2.17, which tells us that sin leads to death, and that's also stated in Romans 6.23. If you read carefully through Exodus and Leviticus, you will discover that there is a death decree associated with all but one of the Ten Commandments. So what do you think? Are we going to see God withdraw his protecting hand from the earth and allow Satan to have more and more control so the universe can see what would happen if Satan were in charge? Or do these plagues represent God's own powerful and angry response to sin? In the book of Revelation, we are seeing a storyline develop. We're seeing two sides of the story. God will not be causing everything. There are two antagonistic for forces. God is on his side, and the devil will be associ and his associates are on the opposing side. As we read through the rest of Revelation, we must be very careful to observe who is doing what, which of these two opposing sides is causing events to occur. So, what do we have here? We have an all-out life and death war. Satan is trying to destroy all of God's people here on this earth. And then he's going to, he would like to claim that this earth belongs to him and his people. He would like to tell God, get lost, take your people if you like, get out of here. You can have the rest of the universe, but leave this world to us. And what's God's response? No, no way. In fact, I'm going to make this earth my future headquarters. And Satan must be saying, oh no. Because he knows that this is the only place he can go right now. And if God comes to make this his headquarters, what happens to Satan? There's no room left for him. We'll see you next week.